Hello everyone and uh, welcome to another public event in the frame of the course uh, Contemporaneity and Art, Samti de Konst, uh, in the frame of the Stockholm University of the Arts. Um, and I'm very happy to, to be able to welcome uh, two uh, very interesting uh, and unique uh, artists, uh, Johannes Maria Schmidt, uh, uh, who is, uh, a, apart from being a theater director, the director also currently our oh. candidate um, at Escoja, and uh, Igilund Malmbori, uh, who is uh, a very well-known uh, Swedish uh, performer and actor. And the two of them are in a conversation together because uh, apart from working individually, uh, they used to uh, work uh, or maybe it's still ongoing, which is something that we're gonna find out about more soon, uh, within the, the artistic duo or a project called White on White. And, uh, uh, they are going to uh, present us uh, some form of an artistic debate or a discussion uh, with the title Access After the Sustainable Turn. And this is where I'm going to uh, stop and uh, give floor to Johannes and Iggy. Okay, thank you so much and uh, thanks for having us. Uh, Iggy and I agreed that I was going to give a small um, sort of introduction to what we're about to do um that is just for the mere fact that i'm a phd candidate and i'd like to introduce myself to to all of you because i haven't seen you much but for some of you the ma students i've got the chance to meet already but in general uh one of the ideas of the institution is to mix more the research part and uh, the education so i'll take the chance to to um it, it'll take me five minutes to just give an overview of what we're doing before we engage in our conversation. Um, let me just um, um, start by saying that this question of contemporarity or, or samti, that's a bit easy in, in Swedish, something that has been bothering me a lot, like what the question like, what is a contemporary? And there was an essay by Giorgio Agamben that asks that exact, exact question. It is entitled, what is a contemporary? Maybe you read it, I don't know. But there is a quote that I wanted to read to you that, that was very helpful for me. And that is, contemporariness is a singular relationship with, with one's own time, which adheres to it and at the same time keeps a distance from it. More precisely, it is that relationship with time that adheres to it through a, dis a disjunction and an anachronism. So this idea that being a contemporary is actually not being up to date, but is to be sort of not up to date uh, was quite helpful for me when I thought about what it is. And, and maybe today what we can offer you is to look at our not being up to date in the past. So what, our, what, what we will look at is the immediate past, which is the tenor years for us. And more specifically, an artistic expression that was possible uh, in, as we would say, the Obama administration. Um, so actually, our tenor years are from, go from 2008 to 2016. In this period, Iggy and I, we did a performance series called White on White um, that, was also, that was done by the duo White on White. The duo still exists, the series is over. Um, we will want to give you an insight into what this series was, and we will do that through uh, a short video excerpt and narration, storytelling, if you want. But for now, I would just like you to read the titles of the series to you, the six pieces we did, because they um, probably speak for themselves partly. So in 2009, we did White on White number one, The Rapyrus. In 2010, we did White on White number two, The Invisible Empire. 2011 was White on White number three, a non-controversial shit in the black box. And um, 2012, White on White number four, Enjoy Whiteness. Same year, we did White on White number five, All Those Beautiful Boys. And 2014, we, we did White on White number six, Queer Cells. That was the last piece that um, we, 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 we made within the series, but we kept on touring the other pieces and adapting them to sort of the touring context until 2016. Maybe it's just important to mark, sorry. Yeah. 
that number two and number four are collaborative work or they work with other uh, makers. Exactly. So it's three pieces that are, that are made in the duo and we will rather focus on those. Exactly, we will only focus on the duo pieces basically. Mm -hmm. um, and the series came to an end um, for a reason that will maybe get obvious to you and ever, but we'll talk about that later, but ever since we've been sort of pursuing our practices on an individual level, mostly um, Iggy under his own name as a solo artist or, and, and also in collaborations um, and me in different constellations also under my own name as a theater director and, and recently film director. So since 2019, I am a PhD candidate in the, in the uh, St. Const uh, Performing Arts Department. And just to give you a short context, my own research is focused on the actor-director relation and models of consent within that, within that relation. And I'm trying to formulate a valid alternative to an emerging paradigm of rehearsal practices where the idea of consent is the maintenance of each other's comfort zone, if you want. And I'm trying to look into what alternative models there are where consent could be formulated as a mutual transgression. Uh, between actor and director? How, can, how, could, how could that be sort of ethically um, safeguarded? And this spring, I've been looking more precisely into what transgression is actually for me. For me, it's, it's a concept that I like to throw around, but I, 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 I sort of wanted to look into the, the whole sort of within the 20th century, like how, to, how did this term uh, come up and when was it connotated in a positive way and when did it get a negative connotation basically and my supervisor that is also here today you he uh, he suggested that that i was going to look into this book that we will be using today as as a as a sort of backdrop to our talk and if you have it uh, maybe you can hold it to the front and I, and I believe you'll have to make some sound so we uh, see kill all normies uh, <laughs> What is it? The online culture, online culture wars from 4chan and Tumblr is from from the old right? Exactly. And the That's author the is the screen. No, I don't know. I don't see myself. I, I turned myself off, so I don't know if, if this is happening. I don't. I don't want to talk to myself here. Uh. I'm seeing all of you. Um, so, my the idea here in this book is it's actually offering an, an analysis of the tenor years. It was published in 2017, and thereby it is an, an analysis of the 10 years that I just talked about. And um, when I read it, it was a, quite an exciting, or it, I thought it gives us an opportunity to reread our performance series um, that, that uh, Egan and I did. And um, this is what, what we will try today, basically to pr present our work and some of the main arguments of this, of this book, of the points Angela Nagel makes. And this perspective for me has been quite a vertigo perspective when I read the book. It's very sort of, um, it gives a, a reading that is quite disorienting, I would say, for what we try to do artistically in, the, in, in those t uh, tenor years. And the first or the main claim of the book is basically that transgression as a marker of counterculture and fighting against an establishment is not by necessity bound to a politics of the left. Transgression is not necessarily a politics of progressive left, basically. And, and um, yeah, that analysis together with an analysis that Angela Nagel gives about the millennial, which would be our generation, at, at least definitely it is in mine, where she says that the millennial is a product of two individualisms, the individualism of the right, which would be a Thatcherism sort of formulated or, or epitomized in the formula, there is no such thing as society, there are only families, men and women, uh, and the individualism of the left, which is identity politics and an idea of defending and expressing yourself. Um, those two individualism have shaped the millennial. In the 90s, they merged into some kind of um, corporate, private being. And with, this, with these two analy analyses, basically saying transgression is not a, not a prerogative of the left and the millennial is something in between left and right, we revisit our series and we look at, the, basically our working question is, um, have the transgressions of the white and white series 
been part of a possibly outdated leftist countercultural strategy, or have they unconsciously mirrored an emergent tactics of the on online alt right? We're, we're giving, we're, we're re looking into what we did under that sort of open question. And in order to do so, um, we have been reading the book and we've been formulating questions to each other that we, that we present ourselves with like, like one by one now after, after or when we start. But just to say, as a level, so for the transparency of it, we have been, so yesterday we had a, had a meeting where we presented our questions to each other just in order to be able to, to see if there is some overlap or something. So there is a little bit of curation when it comes to the question. There is no curation when it comes to the answers. Like we, we will still try to answer them in the moment and we will put, most of all answer them sometimes from the perspective of the duo, but also from the perspective of our solo practices. So there have been four years without the duo as a constant, as, as our only workplace, which it has been for a while. And we will try to include these kind of perspectives, uh, the solo perspectives as well. Yes, um, like Anya said, we, we will, or like Gigi also said, we will be cutting this in, in 45 minutes. We will just end it abruptly at, at uh, 4.30. And then there is time for your questions for, for 30 minutes. And we're really interested to hear sort of what this sparks, because I believe there is a huge uh, break there is a, a turn, uh, the title suggests it's a sustainable turn, but there is definitely a huge turn ever since this series was made to today. Um, we, ah, yeah, I, I'm, in terms of the Zoom protocol, we won't be reading the chat whilst we talk to each other so we can focus on each other. Um, if you have questions, you, you're of course welcome to note them already in there, just if you need it as a note, as a note board or something, but we won't be reading it. We will make sure that you get all the references we're dropping within this lecture. We'll get it to you, like the quotes or, or, or whatnot. Um, mostly we will represent our series through narration, but now we would like to show you a small video. And that is of this piece, uh, White on White number six, the last piece we did, that we felt we couldn't really get over the threshold of 2016 so that we stop touring. Is there any immediate question or do you have something to add, Iggy? Or shall we just go? Uh, let's go. Okay, cool. So I'll try to share my screen here. And it's, it takes about eight minutes and then you'll see. Do you see this? Yeah. Yes. Cool, off we go. And I'll close this one. Oh. <laughs> Hi. Hey. Hey. My name is Iggy Monbord. My name is Johannes Schmidt. And together we are white on white. And as unhappy artists, we're very happy to be here. <laughs> Um, welcome to tonight, the piece that is entitled White on White number six, Queer Cells. And the, the six, the number in the title, that is there to prove or, or to, to show that this is a series that we're working on, also entitled White on White. And that series is supposed to be a long-term, uh, life-lasting project. Mm -hmm. And this is the sixth part, exactly. It could be nine or six, yeah. We don't and that, that project, or, or this series, it has a pretty clear aim, or it has an aim, uh, which is clear in the moment, but then gets kind of reformulated for every piece, so that to get sharper and sharper and defined. And for now, for number six, we would say that the aim of White White, of the whole series, is to analyze the appearance of mainstream power and to frame it. And that, main, that appearance uh, seems to have changed a bit lately. And it was already when we started, it was going on, we started in 2009, but now it is really shaky because all the faces start to change. And it feels like, like the, of course, the kind of old type of white male patriarch like that has been swiped off anyhow. Yeah, of course. Yeah, exactly. this. But then those kind of sweet and cute and smart guys like standing up here, huh? also they are threatened. Yeah, 
tell that they might not longer be here in Hawaii. Yeah, and, and uh, so how, how would the new power mm. we have to ask? What, what could be a new consistency of power? If these guys are no longer supposed to be here, or are about to be thrown away, who is going to come instead? We'll, we will kind of look in around amongst the most powerful people in the world, and we will try to spot kind of a trend. Yeah, what's the new deal? And we have found a trend, and we have two examples, so two kind of origins. <laughs> the most successful ones in the world, and uh, you all know them. It's the Queen of Europe, the President of the United States. And as you can tell on their, on their surface, or on, on their appearance, it's kind of like that they're completely mainstream. Like we have a white, uh, male, bourgeoisie, most likely intersection. So they're rich, completely rich. mainstream. Yeah. 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 But the thing, or what, what, what one have to say, <laughs> is that in both these cases, there is something in their identity that kind of points towards an exception. That is an exception from the minor, or from the majority, from the mainstream, which rather points towards a minority status, so kind of underdog position. And uh, when we were working on, oh, yeah, when we were working on uh, uh, our last piece, you know, well, when we found those guys, we were still working on one of the five, all those beautiful boys. Mm. And for those who've seen it, um, here the idea was that basically the, the, the sense that is ruling our perception is the eye. So that doesn't sound so spectacular, but maybe one could say that uh, when you came in and you saw us, you knew everything about us. And because everything, like our complete identity would be proven in our surfaces, in our appearances. That was the claim. Uh, and and so, so when you saw us, for example, then you would know like our racial identity, or gender identity, social status, mm -hmm. and but most likely our trauma. Yeah, or everything. Childhood trauma. Yes. Our account, bank account. Yeah, like that. And looking at and to do these two examples when we started, obviously the exception in their identity from the from the mainstream is of course to be read in the surface, in the visibility. And if that is the new consistency of power, like having that mainstream identity mixed with one exception. And if it is about the eye that rules or that is kind of the master sense, then that means that these guys that you see here, they have a problem. Yes. Because in, in our identity, there's nothing that can prove a, a, like an authentic uh, minority mark. Now we're completely mainstream. Yeah, we have look at us. We're completely mainstream. Looking a bit better. Yeah. So that means that we're going to be thrown off. Yeah. And what happens? So we are pretty threatened. Yeah. What happens when this identity, the white male heterosexual, or, uh, or the white male identity, gets kind of threatened or pushed into a corner? That's like like that can have rather violent effects, one has to say. Mass murder, Alexander. We've seen it some one and a half years ago. It was two, two and a half. Uh, like in summer 2011, there were some 77 people killed based on the fact that a white male subject was kind of pushed into a car. Mm. We don't like mass murder. No, actually, that can't happen. So we have to stay in power. And to do that, how to do that with this kind of face, like how to stay in power how to produce the authentic effect of a minority mark in our identity. We didn't know. We didn't know, no, we were lost. But somebody knew, already, already 10 years ago, there was somebody that had foreseen this trend, so that this is about to happen, and that could just make a, he made a move. Uh, he was kind of a pioneer, like he could tell that I will be thrown off that central, central position in our state, and I will prevent that from happening. Uh, and it's very, very Design over there. That one maybe you don't know. It's that one. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and maybe you do. Some. Uh, it's, it's the former pre uh, prime minister of Sweden, John Pash. Exactly. <laughs> and applying kind of the tools of, of number five to that one, like saying the eye is what gives us the complete information about a person. Like it's very obvious that this is a sexist. Uh, right? Or probably a rapist. <laughs> Most likely a rapist. Most likely. Yeah. Um, and, and, but that's, that's applying the tools of number five. But one had to say that when, when one got to know about him, he was kind of swearing on TV and so on, he was a um, sexist, or he is a sexist, the fucking ass. You can see it like now if you want, don't want to read it on his face because you don't want to judge people, like you don't want to judge the book by the cover. Uh, you can look into it and you will, have to, you will have to admit that he's also behaving like a fucking asshole. Uh, I mean, like in a debate, uh, well, one debate, he would. There would be a, a question. Or he, he asked something from a female, uh, another politician. politician, and then he wrote an answer. He turned his back. 
this kind of thing. And then or speaking loud, yeah, or kind of like classical power techniques, mm -hmm. make, making people invisible, speaking with a loud voice, all that kind of stuff. Having pauses in his arguments, it could be 30 seconds long. Mm -hmm. And if somebody tried to intervene, like, oh, then it would make sense. So he was a sexist, most obviously, but he found a strategy, like, where because he was going to rally for the second term of his uh, legislation. What if no, there was several of them before. Mm. But, but he was a, it was a new election coming up, and he had a problem, of course, because this new consistency of power started to threaten him. What did he do? He was in an interview with the biggest newspaper in Sweden. And there, this guy, looking like that, came out as a feminist. <laughs> And uh, since he did that, like, or after he did that, he was basically hard to criticize. But it was difficult to get at him with some kind of feminist critique or, or even as such. Like, he was pretty well protected by now. He could keep on walking around the world looking like this, behaving like that, yeah. and, and was somehow immune for, for critique. He had that face for another four years. Yeah. He, he was really. Like, and how did he do it? That was our question. How did that guy actually made it to stay. How could it succeed like that with the hell? Okay. <laughs> this far. Mm. This, uh, uh, short picture. There's not a lot of aesthetics in this one. It's just more talking, but uh, we'll be happy to share the link if, if it will be aesthetics at some point in this piece. So we'll, it's we'll only see. speech in that one. And a bit of blood. It's some, some transgressive action. Mm. One could say that even in all the all the works that we did, all the duos, they, they have one, one action that involves traditional body art or something. In, in that one, it was uh, blood. So we would cut our foreheads and, and we claim that when blood arrives, truth, truth appears. That's it. Hey, but could you all hear it? There was something funny with the sound, I had a feeling. It had a small delay, but... Uh... It was on the verge of audi audibility. Yeah, okay, okay. Sorry, let's get better at this. But let's go into the questions, or? Yeah, you start digging. Uh, now the, the intro is maybe hinting towards something else, but we will, we will talk about the whole series. That was part of the introduction of number six. I will start with a quote from, uh, uh, Nagel, Nagel. Here she speaks about Milo. Uh, you can see it there from I'll show the on screen. Uh, Milo Yenoopoulos, you pronounce it. I think one of the one of the front figures of the old track. That would also be the editor of Bright Park. There you go. So. Oh, yeah. Do you see it? Yes. Milo's favorite description of the unifying trolley sensibility across the new wave of the online right is transgressive. Oh, Iggy, now, oh. now I've lost, uh, it's this one, I'm sorry. Ah, sorry. And this is here. Yeah. That's the one. Yeah. Milo's favorite description of the unifying trolley sensibility across the new wave of online right is transgressive. Ever the unconvincing conservative, he would often say things like, the best sex is dangerous, transgressive, dirty, and that conservatism is the new punk because it's transgressive, subversive, punk. He regularly makes the comparison between punk and the alt-right, and obviously he's using the term in the broadest possible way. The ease with which this broader alt-right and alt-light media and use transgressive styles today shows how superficial and historically accidental it was that it ended up in any way being associated with social slap. That maybe expand, or like what you mentioned in the, in the start, Johannes, uh, which could maybe be the basic claim of Nail, um, Nagel in the book, is that, that the usage of transgressions is not, uh, the, the ideology behind the transgressive itself is per se moldable. We could associate it automatically with the left, but she claims not the case. And now, into the questions. Now we're going to talk about number three. Mm. Uh, in number three of the series, we had a very clear aim, an aim that could even be, be heard in the title. It's called the non-controversial shift in the black box. 
And pooping was, at that point, that was the most radical transgression we could think of. Uh, meaning that it was breaking the taboo, and it was important, it, it had never been done in the venues we were performing, so it was always the first time. There we also, we both did a, a breaking of the taboo, a transgression, and we also introduced something new. And by doing that, at the same time as we were framing what we would consider as to be the logic of transgression, and also the, the say the performing arts field, or the arts field maybe as such, its obsession about the new, we thought that we would render this action non-controversial, or even, even uh, conventional. And what lies, what we wondered then, and I think that still stays, that what lays in, in, a, in an action except its immediate reaction, its immediate cultural uh, reaction, so that this would be repulsion, disgust, provocation. Um, we showed it many times, quite many times, and now a decade has passed, and we are much older and, and more wrinkled. So I wonder, Johannes Maria Schmidt, was it a mistake? Uh, was it a mistake to believe that the intention and framing of a transgressive action could ever obfuscate its shocking value? Hmm. Well, um, maybe one has to talk about the setup of pooping. Uh, oh. that's done like or first of all maybe one needs to say that the logics of transgression or the idea was that that by introducing that logics of transgression sort of like an idea of some kind of economy of overstepping within those art spaces we thought that if everybody sees that logics the head will understand that the poop is an affirmative action. It's something that is helping the spaces to live on rather than destroying them, if you want. And and um, I think we, we were intending to create a divide between a rational realization, maybe an intellectual epiphany, and a bodily uh, reaction, an objection, or an objection reaction. So to talk about the setup of the pooping, it was that the idea was that always one of us would be doing the pooping thing as we considered ourselves serial. We didn't both have to do the action, but one of us was looking out and the other one was facing with the back um, pooping. And I think that was the, or the interesting moment was the shows for me where I wasn't the one pooping, but looking out because I could somehow witness what it was doing. And, um, despite the rationalization around it and despite the idea that this very transgression is part of the logics of transgression and sort of part of that bigger economy of, of innovation, like you said, doing the new or doing the thing that has never been done within a space, it still produced the, the sort of very physical reaction. Uh, it was, sometimes I felt like it is this moment of the train driving into the cinema back in the early day, or in sort of the first days of cinema when the poop arrived, but, but um, yeah, so I don't know if that answers your question right away, but, but I, I don't, I don't think it was, a, I don't think it, or I still think it was quite a, quite a, um, a valid strategy to sort of create that disconnect or, or, or make people aware or the audiences aware on the one hand that it is a very conventional thing to do within those spaces, but not leave them untouched or not leave them still so sort of still create an an embodied experience of what the transgression is which also has to do i guess I'm, i know we talked a lot about it like does every generation need to do their transgressions over and over again because there's sort of no archive or there is no embodied archive of what it means to overstep a taboo like and and um yeah, I don't, I don't know if that answers to your question. Also, in I would be interested in hearing how you relate that to to Milo and 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 uh, like or how that relates for you to to the mm. the alt right logics. Did they could they not refer to the archive that was there in the left, the archive of overstanding? Mm. Sort of like why did they need to create their own as a generation? Mm. And it seems, of course, like. Now we're leaving the structure, but it seems like they do feel darker. Or Milo's reference to punk 
uh, is in the long run a reference to, to uh, body art or the performance art of the 60s. Mm. But, but, and his point is always that it's, that it's fun. Uh, it is uh, thrilling and so on. And thereby an effective political tool. Mm -hmm. Which might not be the case with, the, with some of our artist heroes. But which might not be the case with what? The case with our artist heroes. To, to aim for the thriller, uh, mm. rather to go for the offense. Mm. Yeah, I think we try to take the fun out of it. Like, mm. or, like or, I know sort of one of the references for us with this body art thing has been Jackass, the series from the 90s, uh, where sort of physical transgressions were turned into some kind of dudish pleasure, if you want. Mm. And uh, I think we've been trying to be a jackass of this very intellectual space, uh, which is the, the venues that we were performing in. But at the same time, um, trying to reduce the level of, of jouissance or like pure enjoyment of transgressing actually. Like it, it was a very rational setup that we created also. There was no spontaneity in, I mean, in this show, it was, it was sort of based on this idea of making a show with no surprises. Mm. So the first thing that was addressed in the same type of intro as in Queer Cells, the first thing was, uh, that was addressed was that there was going to be that shit in two and a half hours from here. Mm. Mm. That is, an is that sort of an answer? Mm -hmm. okay, I'll move on to, to the question I have for you. Um, and it relates to this kind of culture of anonymity um, Within the within the alt right online culture, if you want, mm. and um, like I like in these ten years that I I I have just uh, sort of tried to to put into a chrono normative 2008 to 2016 structure. Um, I I or I remember being on Facebook meant uh, being a character. So so I I was having fake names. I was Gito Fistafilli or I was Sugar Mountain or Johannes Dragon or I was all kinds of names and I got off in 2012 so, not, so I can't really tell how it happened but what I know and what Nagel also describes is that social media has sort of transformed into those de-anonymized platforms and, and uh, whilst back in the days I felt like sometimes one, one could even make a joke about the profile posting something Nowadays, it is clearly the, the figure behind. So if Trump can make a tweet that is actual politics, it's very obvious that there is no, that there is no divide between the profile and the person that posts. And um, I wonder, in our, in our pieces, we, we always have been putting those clear names at the start. My name is Egilon Malmboy. My, my name is Johan Schmidt, whatever. And that we have been doing based on a performance art tradition that sort of wanted to, to avoid any kind of uh, mi misconception of us being characters or even a stage alter ego should not, should not be seen. So we've been quoting something, but I, I, I feel looking back, I feel it relates to a certain divide within online culture. Like, like what is this to put the, the names first? And um, looking at the 4chan, um, just for everyone, the 4chan homepage. I, d I didn't know about it until I read Nagel, so maybe it's important to, to give a small uh, idea. It's, it's a homepage where um, there is very obscure content and, and you can post anonymously. I'm just gonna quote quickly from, from, what, um, from how uh, Nagel describes it. Just bear with me for a second. Then you can, then you can also see it. Uh, wait, this one. Um, this culture of anonymity fostered an environment where the users went to air their darkest thoughts. Weird pornography, in-jokes, nerdish argo, gory images, suicidal murderous and incestuous thoughts. Racism and misogyny were characteristics of the environment created by the strange virtual experiment. But it was mostly funny memes. So this is a this is a this is a culture I've I've been ignoring. Like I, I wasn't aware of that one, but still I think it relates to to what we've been doing because um, 
what happens here with anonymity is that you create a divorce from the person you are. You can create a character, of course, that's obvious, but mostly you can be judged by what you're saying. And that very much relates to an opposite strategy of what we've been using, where we've been stressing sort of in the best intention of critical whiteness theory, we've been stressing the speaker's location. We've been always naming ourselves as the white subjects we are. And, um, and trying to make it clear that we're speaking from that very position. And still I can't shake the, 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 the notion that you and I might also have been posting anonymously in our series. <laughs> so I wonder, what, I wonder how you think about that. I wonder how you, how you feel about that. Um. I think, um, to some extent, I, I, I th actually, I think we, we belong to both traditions, one could say. Um, on the one hand, of course, it's been very important for us to, to name ourselves and face or like to, to start every show with my name is Ege and Hamas, um, put ourselves in a, in a traditional performance art, like Chris Burden would say, hello, my name is Chris Burden, and I will be shut down. And Jackass can say, hello, my name is Johnny Knoxville, and now I'm going to jump out the window. That's, that's one thing. But, but what, what, what I think I would say one of the, ma the, the major fuel of the whole series, thinking of whiteness, would be to say that the, these two guys that you see, we are completely exchangeable. We are serial. We are more or less the same. Uh, people, or <laughs> like, based on, on the privileges that are gained to us through our visibility, through our appearance, you can take any other white middle class guy. It doesn't matter. Mm -hmm. And that was, uh, that was, uh, uh, to say, a strategy against maybe, or to try to, to remove the greatest white privilege of us, as we saw it, being that the white community is, is, the, un the community that would be seen as universal. You never have to, to speak from the position of being white, or you're never addressed as a group. You white people, you can just, uh, So we try to do that. You mean you we try to give the possibility to address us as white people? Is that mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, Exactly, or to speak of the group, to say, even if we step up here as, uh, and, and, and present ourselves by name, sound in singular, there is no individuality or there is no, no uh, strong subjectivity here. We're just uh, examples or like structural examples of a organization of the environment. Mm -hmm. uh, something like that. On the other hand, there is, a, there is a, um, there, I think there is an ambiguity with saying, with presenting yourself, this maybe moves on, but, but by presenting yourself by name on stage or in a theater context. First of all, we only we show the works in, in black boxes in theater, except the documentation we saw. That's in a, not in a white. It's in a theater, but it's painted white. Mm. Uh, but we, but we showed it through, like it was clear that we were in a theater tradition. We didn't work in galleries or, or public spaces. Or anything else. So that means that we are in the in the tradition of fiction. So we use this ambiguity or the temporality of the theater situation, meaning that whatever we say here can be doubted. Like mm -hmm. It might be how much that is speaking. Or when we say, I, if I say my name is Iggy, you don't know for sure what it means. When Jordan Passion that we mentioned in the, in the intro of number six, when he claims to be a feminist, he has to stand you know, in a press conference. He has to stand in for it afterwards. On stage, it's much more uh, ambiguous. Mm. And I think that makes a clear cut also between our, our practices, both in the series but also later, where we've been returning to transgressions again and again, compared to, to uh, 4chan, where the, the politics of language is not as clear. Mm. It, it, it doesn't have the same temporality. I, uh -huh, that's interesting because I, I would even think that that's exactly the kind of space that they are creating. Like, I, I, or Nagel is talking so much about mm -hmm. the idea that 
the normies will always go wrong trying to decode a, a, a thread on, on 4chan because they will take it literally. They will sort mm. of take it as, as a given word or they will take it as something that is meant. Remember in, in Queer Cells, we, later on in the intro, we argue that everything we say here, we can be questioned for in the, in the bar or wherever mm. we can be talked about, to about. Mm. And uh, somehow- I wonder too, like, oh, sorry, finish. No, but it sounds like that, that is a bit the same space, like the, the, the 4chan space and this space on stage. You mm. can say a lot of stuff, but mm. you, you, you can't take, you will not have to take full responsibility for it. Yeah, that's the question. Or they come just from outside the convention is not clear. Mm. They, they, as you say, they use this in humor constantly. Mm. Uh, but what we do know is that the results of their speech acts or, or uh, their argumentation results in mass murder in, in another way. Uh, and and uh, it's, it's rather hard to decode from us from, from outside, as it doesn't have a convention. It's, she talks about the, it's a maze of meaning also in, with, with uh, internal jokes and also with a, with a like ironic tonality that you can't really, that you can't really grasp. Mm -hmm. Still, I think we, we were, our series was trying to speak truth somehow and fighting with the ambiguity of, of language on stage or with speech acting on stage, mm. uh, given the very set conventional frame that we produce language within. Mm. So, mm. You see what I mean? Yeah, we'll have a follow up question about what that means within a duel, like as you say, right. like, uh -huh. like if, is, if you say, uh, where this strange structural, where a mass somehow being, mm. then at the same. And, but the important thing here, like I want to come back, maybe that is the, the main answer. Mm. Or, uh, fortune, the fortune uh, troll movement is so based on an underlying noise, uh, and they also speak about themselves as the as the language of the people or the ordinary people, what the others don't dare to say, and so on. For us, I think, even though we say our names, the, the, the point was to give a face to to us, and thereby hopefully making it vulnerable. To say mm -hmm. we we will stand in for everything that the white community or or the bourgeoisie or the, uh, is standing for, and um, if you want to attack, here we are. Mm -hmm. Do you want to say that? Yeah, no, I'm fine with that. For, for yeah. now. But now, let's move on. Let's, let's move on to you. you. You would have the next question, right? Yeah. Yeah. Oh my God, it's 17 past. Okay. Yeah. I'll make it quick. Uh, okay. Maybe we have been touching upon some of this before. So that our friendship uh, or our uh, love affair as friends started from, from a common strong admiration of, of uh, mainly performance artists from the 60s. In the core of those, and, and this friendship would also turn into the collaboration. You know? uh, but in the center of, of these artists were the Vienna actionists. I don't know, do, have you used them in your studies, some, all the students? Like, have, no. Is that a reference that is around? Uh, no, yeah, they're talking about Vienna actionists. Yes. No, no talk about that. Sorry? No, no talking about actionismus. Uh, no, 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 we haven't been. Uh, okay. It, it's a group of, of artists from Vienna, from Austria. Um, and I think it's important to say that they are all, they are all sort of post-war children, or they're mainly born during the Second World War, but they're not soldiers themselves. So they are the, they know that their parents' generation, what they have done. Uh, and they are making works, performances and happenings, which they would refer to as actions. Uh, that is definitely using what we would call transgressive. It's actions that are still today. Uh, if you see it, you react with repulsion or disgust. And so or with fascination. <laughs> huh? You can also react with fascination. Yeah, with fascination. There's a mixture. Yeah, which was songs of transgression. Mm -hmm. um, or uh, uh, a battalion of your songs. 
And we would look at that and we would see their strategy as, as a way of revealing the symptoms. So they are these children of the war. And they had, there was kind of disease in, the, in their entire generation. And they wanted to reveal it and show it. And by putting it into the front line, maybe even in the long run becoming something even worse. Um, so, and I think we, took, we, we saw that sort of public identification with the wrong side or with the rot and generation as a kind of antidote uh, and probably or maybe even a more effective tool for change than for instance suggesting an escape group suggesting suggesting change from state representing change mm. uh, and we would bump into the term subversive affirmation medicine mm. which is actually rather old also or from the avant-garde period but we dusted it off and started using it ourselves um, and, and that would be the fundament of the practice. So, in our case, we looked at our identities. So if you would look at, at our appearance and the privilege it gives us, we would be the winners of the world. And we would take uh, prejudice about these identities and try to become that caricature, or like them, becoming something even worse. One example could maybe be in the, in the fifth part of the series, called All Those Beautiful Boys, of a series of narratives where we claim that our bodies are fully based on surgical interventions. We didn't look at all like that in the beginning. But we were lacking privileges and we wanted to get a hold of, of uh, we wanted to get access to the stage that we were standing on. And we couldn't. So we had to change the, the tone of our skin. We had to change, uh, the hands, so they looked like this piano, piano fingers, the bourgeois hands. Uh, we, couldn't, we couldn't reach into the sort of male core of the theater, so we, we operated in some beard in our face, and we would gain this privilege uh, by doing so. Um, I'll, I'll go into a quote. Maybe this is a bit long, but I think we can have use for it later also. Sure. Uh, it's on page 87. What? Page seven. Oh, down here. Yeah. Different types of men's movement? Yeah, that's the one. So, different types of men's movements existed across this trajectory. In the UK, there were progressive groups like Men Against Sexism and the New Men's Movement, which would both be labeled as manginas by today's charming brand of alt right thing, uh, tinged online feminists, anti feminists. Under the banner of men's movement in the US, there were groups uh, with diverse, uh, uh, diverse orientations from Christian men's groups, like Promise Keepers, to the mythopoetic movement uh, of the poet Robert Bly, which searched for a male authenticity lost by, the life, by life in a modern, feminized, automized society. It was in the 90s, during what journalist Susan Flawley described as a backlash against the second wave feminism, in the US in particular, that the formation, formulation of the men's movement that we associate with the term today came from it, which necessitated a certain antagonism towards feminists. The critique of the restricted traditional male sex role gave way to a celebration of masculinity itself, while feminism became the political enemy force. This wave of more overtly anti-feminist men's politics included the National Coalition of Free Men, who took influence from books like Warren Farrell's The Myth of Male Power and Neil Lloydon's No More Sex For, no More Sex For The Failures of Feminism. They rejected the idea of male privilege and focused on discrimination against fathers and violence against men. But even the most militantly anti-feminist forms of pre-internet men's rights activism now seem supremely reasonable and mild compared to the anti-feminism that emerged online in the 2010s. A more openly hateful culture was unleashed on the condition of anonymity, and it took on a more right-wing character, living up to the most negative feminist caricatures of the men's rights activism, rage-filled, hateful, and chauvinistic." End quote. Um, to me, that seems to be an act of affirmation. So the, the men's rights movement had gets critiqued from 
from uh, a feminist point of view, and their, their strategy of defending themselves is to turning into to the, the critique that they're getting, and they become something even worse, a bit like how we have been working. Mm. So Johannes Maria Schmidt, mm -hmm. I wonder, what is the difference between a subversive and a reactionary affirmation? Mm. I have to gain some time. Uh, I have to gain some time by going a little bit back in your question. First of all, when it comes to subversion, I think um, the Vienna actionists have been such an interesting, misleading trajectory somehow for, for us and for some others as well, given that, uh, for me at least, it's only through reading Nagel that I really understand uh, sort of what mainstream is like because because i think they their reaction is clearly to an austrian post-war pretty bourgeois conservative mainstream and we were trying to apply the same strategies whilst we were dealing with a left liberal mainstream mm. and i wasn't aware of that because we also came out of theater schools where there's sort of a, a, a whole different level of pressure it doesn't mirror society at least when we came out from the rather conservative theater schools that we came out, we actually did have that pretty bourgeois sense of needing to break free. But it didn't, it, it, it wasn't, once we had broken free, it felt like, okay, but this is not the society that is out there. The society out there is sort of based on, a, on embracing that level of subversion, maybe not as radical as the Vienna Action has suggested, but definitely, uh, an idea of transgression being part of liberalization or liberal society. Mm. Um, so it's, it has a very positive connotation in that sense, in these kind of societies. And the interesting thing is that the alt-right is fighting the mainstream, but that is, it is another kind of mainstream. And I think that's where our strategies of trying, wanting to be subversive mirror themselves in this trolling thing, because we understand that this is how the mainstream is actually being attacked, or this is where the mainstream gets offended mm -hmm. by, the, by sort of these by these kind of transgressions so i think that's where the the blurry line goes and um when it comes to affirmation first of all i, I have to go along with your thesis here that that uh, these movements are not genuine but that they are identifying with a kind of critique they get and then they affirm that and maybe unconsciously even go further than than what they're what they're what they set out for um i don't know i i i know we're running short on time so i'm, I'm gonna try to make it short i think the only the only way um to be subvert to to make an affirmation like let's say identify with this sort of horrible male white characters the only way to do that was that something is showing <laughs> that it's not us at the same time. So there is something in our performance that suggests that, that, or that, that whilst you see us on stage, makes it, a, makes it clear that it is a, a kind of mask. And, and what should that something be? It's very difficult to track. And we even expose it in, in, a, in, a, in, a, in our last piece. We expose it as a, as a performance of, of queerness, like, or something that we've been, consciously using as this sort of one marker that puts us that takes us out of the the shooting line against the mainstream or against the white mainstream let's say so we we use queerness in a strategic way or we expose ourselves in number six as you in, using queerness in a strategic way mm. but um yeah i don't I, I don't know what makes the affirmation subversive um other than the idea that the two people identifying with the symptom are actually not sick <laughs> that they don't have that disease they don't carry that disease and mm. how how would they not carry that disease it's a structural thing but that's something in their practices daily life practices is is sort of um is is not is not what they're performing there mm. And, um, but now today, like if you think of your, your practice, uh, your, your own practice now, mm -hmm. would you still use affirmation as strategy? 
No, no. I, I think re- like on that it's this turn this that's the sort of watershed in time that, that mm. we've been experiencing is that mm. uh it's too risky. It's too risky to be mixed up with actual racist and and uh, misogynists. So so it's 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 no longer a, for me in my practice it's no longer a a a uh, productive tool because it only triggers stuff that is sort of not it's not 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 possible to to allow for the, or it's not opening for anything basically mm-hmm. it's my feeling mm-hmm. yeah Iggy, we have to we have yeah. to cut it here right sorry it's sad because uh, yeah. <laughs> we have some four four i would like to hear the answer for. i have to ask well, in the own private idaho afterwards Exactly. We can we can have a private Skype afterwards. Yeah. <laughs> sorry, sorry to interrupt, but you can uh, continue for a few more minutes if you if you feel like it. I think that if if we would continue, we would have to dig into like the next chapter, the next questions, and and that would demand more time. Than, than, uh, or we can or we can say like this: um, if there is a question coming up now from from the student side, then, then we're very happy to take it. And, and if not, I, I of course have, have another question to Iggy yeah, that I'd like to ask. I'm sorry, it's not possible because we have to stop recording. Uh, we have to do another oh. minute, yeah. But, but would it be possible, Anya, to say we stop recording and then we go into the other room and, and if we want to, we can still keep on going if there are no questions. Is, yeah. Would that be okay? Okay. Uh, and what happens now? Is it a break now? For a while, or do we go on? Uh, okay, let's make it more formal. <laughs> okay, thank yeah. you for this uh, uh, inspiring intro. Uh, and uh, we will finish this round of discussion for now, and after a short break, uh, we will return to discussing it with.